after the break. Don't miss. Oh yes, you are watching Step in the World, and this time, where in the world are we? You've got 30 seconds to decide. It's a big clue, but there are lots of Greek islands in the Ionian Sea to choose from, and this one's Corfu, a green and pleasant land with every bend in the hairpin roads presenting photographic gems. But unless you explore the coast at sea level, you'll miss the very essence of its delightful charm. The beaches of Corfu may not all have the crunchy sugar white sands of the Caribbean, but they are five hours closer to home, and each one of the hundred or so coves around the island is totally unique. Another knick-knack shop in another country, and another quest for the present for the mother-in-law. No, that's not the mother-in-law. You don't think I'd drag around with me, do you? I always find this the tricky bit. She's not an easy person to choose for, you know. Now that's a distinct possibility. For an island which today is bathed, for the most part anyway, in an aura of tranquillity, it's had a pretty eventful history. Despite being invaded by Goths, Romans, Russians, Turks, the French and the British to name but a few, Corfu seems to have blended all those influences and developed a character all of its own. We went first to Cassiope, a town which today is a veritable ghost of its former holiday status. Cassiope is the busiest town on the north of the island. A few years ago, it was home to the 1830s clubs. These days, though, it's a more tranquil place and a place for families to head to. It's certainly lost its reputation for all-night boogieing and head-banging music. Now, if you're in for that, you need Cavos down the other end of the island, trapped on its own peninsula. But more on that later. Cassiope is still a popular resort, and as we soon found out, the pubs boast just a bit more than a pool table and a dartboard. It's all highly amusing, the way they schedule these movies in the bars. If you were clever, you could move from bar to bar watching movies all day long. And what's more, it wouldn't cost you a drachma. Well, I think we'll skip on the movie watching. We've got things to do, places to see. Sadari was our next port of call, and here the sea was warm, and the beach had its fair share of traditional bucket and spade potential. Hire cars are readily available if you want to take in the mountain scenery. But remember that for the Brits at least, the steering wheel and the gear lever are both where the front passenger should be. Well, Sadari's certainly a bustling little town. Loads of places to eat, lots of tavernas, lots of bars. The beer's about a pound a bottle, that's for the local stuff. And you can eat for around seven pounds a person, including a bottle of the local plant, which I have to say is pretty good. It's these unique little coves like this, the Channel of Love, that makes Sadari famous and draw visitors from all over the island. It's usually peaceful and tranquil. And OK, this time we got it wrong, it's blowing a huli. But this is what it looks like in the brochures. And if you do take a wrong turning, which isn't difficult, well, you can always ask. Palikostritsa. Is this the way to uh, Palikostritsa? That way? Or that way?
I've seen a few good views in my time, especially in this job, but that is one of the best views I've ever seen in Europe. That's the monastery of Thetuku. There's been a monastery here at Palakastritsa since the 13th century, although this delightful building of pastel shades and flowers was built in the 18th century. If you made the climb up to the monastery, you'll find the beaches here a great place to recover. All sand and sociability and stuff. Purely by coincidence, we discovered that Corfu had been invaded by a serious number of hogs. So we thought we'd check out the wildlife. Isn't it incredible, the quiet and calm of beautiful Corfu is ruined slightly by these beautiful machines, Harley Davidson's. There's two there, there's another two there. In fact, here's some more. There's another one. Another one. Okay, there's lots of them. How many holies all together? I, I know, I've, I've heard 600, I've heard 800. Some people reckon there's a thousand, who knows? Pick a number that sounds good, that'll be the one. <laughs> Actually, including the non registered bikes, there were more like 1,500 Harleys on parade. I think the attraction of Harley Davidson is that every bike here is unique, even though there's probably only about eight models in the range. Every individual comes along and makes it to his or her liking. And uh, they're all works of art, I think, every individual one of them. And then on top of that individuality, you have the friendship and the comrade of rallies like this. OK, it's not something that happens every day in Corfu, but we just happen to be there. We've travelled down 2,500 kilometres on our bikes from London, and we're leaving on Sunday. We're having a fantastic time, and we're just, well, just unbelievable. <laughs> Now, they might look a little daunting. Steel helmets, black leathers, bandanas, tattoos, hell's angels and all that. But amongst them were company directors, bank managers and plumbers. In some cases, they were overweight and over 50. But they're all there in the sun, having a ball. And I'll tell you what, from a personal point of view, it beats the hell out of train spotting. Corfu Town is one of the most attractive capitals I've ever visited. Wherever you go at night, whether it's the open plazas or the narrow, colourful, winding streets, you feel safe. And that, these days, is a big holiday bonus. But I think it's actually in the evening that you should visit Corfu Town. It's lovely, it's bustling, largely because of the long siestas they have in the afternoon. Then everyone comes out shopping. It's cooler for starters, but it's still very warm. Variety seems to be the byword for shopping in Corfu town, although the price tags on designer wear have a distinct edge on the UK high street. What do you have to do to be a presenter, Ben? Yeah. And he has a go, that's about product placement. Yeah. Well, I'm mentioning, you can't talk about product placement now, I'm mentioning cat. <laughs> hey, there's no favoritism. <laughs> You're watching Head for the Med on the Travel Channel.
Switching from the nighttime shopping to daytime sightseeing in Corfu town presents two distinctly different experiences. Traffic seems to follow the town's outskirts, which means strolling is safe, relaxing is essential, and pedestrian precincts are the norm rather than new concepts. This town reflects the wonderful mixture of its past history. This building, for instance, is left by the French, the Liston Arcade. And if you think it looks familiar, that's because it's modelled on the Rue de Rivoli in Paris. And thank you to the British for this fine building, St Michael's and St George. And rather oddly, it's now a museum of Asian art. And it's thanks to the British that Corfu boasts the only cricket pitch in Greece. The fact that the pavilion is an open-air bar and the trophy room happens to be in a side street is immaterial. These guys are keen. The bowling pitch might not impress Geoffrey Boycott, but then few pitchers suffer a Harley Davidson open-air convention on the night before. You can actually score a minus six if you knock the ball into the road, so the Corfu game requires a gentle touch. The umpire was a little unconventional too, but I can live with that. Bowling only takes place from one end, and outfielders are regarded as local heroes. It can be dangerous out in the traffic. The guys are drinking beer today, but sometimes they even drink ginger beer after the match. But me, I'm a man of tradition. Here's to gin and tonic. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Hmm. It says here, Corfu is the second largest, greenest Ionian island, and best known in Greek as Kerkira. It was Homer's beautiful and rich land, and Odyssey's last stop on his journey home to Ithaca. Shakespeare reputedly used it as a background for the Tempest. It's no wonder that Corfu is considered Greece's most beautiful island. Quaint. very little rise and fall of the tide inshore, and there's a decided lack of currents, so taking the plunge is, well, just wonderful. This is the life for me. I just love these little boats. You can hire them for around £25 a day and explore all the little coves that Corfu's got to offer. But the best thing is, is that when you're getting a tad hungry, you can just choose yourself a tavern to moor alongside to. Now that's what I call living. The locals will tell you that commuting from cove to cove is far quicker by sea than by car. There's no hairpin bends and stuff. So grab a tiller whilst you're here. It's the only way to travel. And if you're lucky, the owner of a local taverna will grab a rope, tie up your boat, and then proceed to wine and dine you. Okay. I'm telling you, it's a tough life. Have you got a table for one very hungry mariner? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. I think we can get Thanks. Okay. I will, we'll be that. Thanks. With your table a couple of feet away from the Ionian Sea, the smell of baked feta cheese with herbs drifting out of the kitchen, you just have to eat. Uh, the feta special. Feta special. Diropita. That's, uh, and that's, that's cheese, cheese spice, yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, pastry food with cheese. Yeah. That's cheese and ham rolling, we call that flogueras. Flogueras. Yes. That's bureki. Bureki. That's aubergines cooked and stuffed with cheese and, her and herbs. Right. And that's cordalia. Skaldalia. This is made with the boiled potatoes and the first garlic. 
just look at that for a mezzi. This tavern has got one of the best reputations for local food in the island. And if you don't mind, I'm going to tuck in. Where do I start? You can start by offering the camera crew something. <laughs> come on, guys. Come and tuck in. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I knew that would happen. <laughs> it's good. It's a very good. These taverners haven't just appeared to meet the current tourism boom. They have a history, as my host, Pyrocles, explains. This tavern has been in my family for over 100 years. I ran this place myself uh, for now 25 years. And I'm hoping to carry on for until I retired. After that, uh, I hope that my children, maybe my daughters or my son, is going to carry on for me. Now, your father was called Nicholas. Yes. You've taken it on, and now you have a young boy. I, yes, I take it off uh, for my father, which is his name, as he says, Nicholas. Yeah. And now I also have a son called Nicholas. And uh, the funny thing in this story is that uh, my son is really born the same day as my father has his name day, on the 6th of December. So Nicholas I hope Day. Nicholas Day, Nicholas is coming to the new family. I hope that Nicholas is carrying on this place. That's fantastic. Great family values. That's probably why you're such friendly people. Uh, as an, another, another possibility is that, I guess, it is. It is. One, another thing which is also keeping, uh, you know, the people uh, close to the tourists, if, we, if I can put it that way, it is because we are really close to our family. Yeah. It's nice. Uh, we will try and we wish that all the news people, as I said, keeping that. There's also another part of the traditional things which is uh, still happening in Corfu Island and in the most of the places of Greece. It's a beautiful <laughs> island. You like it? I do. Do you I think you it. come back again? Oh, definitely. definitely. That's, that's nice. It's <laughs> nice to know, you see? Why do you have to come back again? Oh, it's very attractive. It's very green. It's very nice. But it's the people. It is the people? Yeah, I think so. That's nice. to Corfu because they're everywhere. It's a funny thought that that last olive that you stabbed with one of those little cocktail sticks probably came from here. The olive industry has been here for centuries and it was started off by the Venetians who actually offered farmers money for every hundred trees that they grow. And if you've ever wondered how you pick an olive tree, well you don't. What you do is you lay nets out around the base and you wait for the olives to drop. They do that here biannually, and then there's a big rush to make sure that they pick all the olives before they lose the oil and their value. There's an estimated 14 million olive trees growing in Corfu, so it's no wonder the island appears so green. Come to think of it, that's a lot of olives. Say, 2,000 olives per tree? Mm, now that's about 2.8 billion olives. I'll let you convert that into gallons of oil. Well, I think that's enough about olive trees. Oh, look at that. Hey. He didn't whoop, whoop. <laughs> he didn't, well, I have on holiday. He didn't come very far, did he? You can camp in Corfu, and there's a good selection of hotels, but self-catering in a villa clinging to the side of a mountain is attracting more and more people. Villas, it seems, are becoming a way of life. Philip Nash and his friends and family booked their villa with operator something special, and they've been coming back for many years. Well, we, we don't like stopping in, in hotels uh, on an island like this. We like to be completely free to go out to tavernas and have, you know, have a bit of food in, not much. But mostly eat in the tavernas. They're so good and very cheap. Uh, the hotels we found, when we have stayed, we haven't really been very impressed with the international cuisine. It's not, it's not our scene. You pretty well have everything you need here. It's, it's like home from home, isn't it? Well, this is, yes. It would, uh, it would suit as if this was our home. <laughs> it, it's really about the best one we've had. There are a number of companies offering villa accommodation in Corfu, ranging from the basic to the downright luxurious, and of course prices do vary depending on the time of year. 
but with Corfu's winter temperatures never going much below 20 degrees, even a winter holiday is worth considering. And believe me, if you're between 18 and 30, an age group that sadly I'm moving rapidly away from, this is the place to be. And as far as the rest of Corfu is concerned, Kavos could be on another planet. They like the music loud around here. I mean, should I say loud? And if this looks a nightmare to you, well, don't worry, because Kavos is isolated on the southern tip of the island. Tucked away in a quaint little Mexican restaurant in Kavos. Next door is a Thai restaurant. Down the road is good old British fish and chips. You get a bit of everything here. What really amuses me is the local music trying to drown out the disco music from down the road, trying to drown out some 60s music from the place next door. The night here just goes on and on. It starts about 12 and it goes through till 4 or 5 in the morning. That's too late for me, I'm afraid. If you are mad enough to dip your toes into the chaos of Kavos, there's always the tranquility of the real Corfu to help you get over the experience. I stayed in the northeast of the island at Nasaki, just a couple of miles of sea separating me from the hills of Albania. Well, that's it. That's your lot. Till the next time.